So my research is concerned with the membranes that are around the outside of cells. And the membrane is like the, the wall of a building. It separates the inside of the cell from the outside. Everything that comes in or goes out has to go through the membrane. And we use computational methods to take the experimental structures of the proteins, which are like the doors in the building, and to understand how they work. So that's a fundamental scientific problem, but it's also of great medical importance. So these proteins in the membranes, about 20% of all genes correspond to these proteins. And about 50% of drugs are targeted at membrane proteins. They're very important in terms of both existing drugs and new drugs in the future. And this can impact on a range of diseases, on diseases of the nervous system, on cancer, but also on antibiotics. So many bacteria and also tumour cells are resistant to drugs because they pump the antibiotic back out of the cell. So the, the protein is the way the drug gets out of the cell. So if we could inhibit those, we could improve antibiotics, we could improve anti-cancer drugs. But also, many drugs that act inside the cell have to get into the body, across the, across the membranes of the cells in your gut. And the proteins there, the transporter proteins that take across natural nutrients like peptides can also transport drugs. And one of the projects in my lab working closely with experimentalists in the biochemistry department in Oxford is to look at how these transporters transport drugs into the system and to exploit that knowledge to aid in the design of new drugs. So I could list a whole range of other diseases as well, but by understanding the shape of these molecules, but also their motions and how they work, that gives us a better insight in either how to exploit them or to prevent their action, and, uh, uh, and in both ways we can improve drug design. You use computer to simulate these studies. Um, can you give an idea of the most relevant contribution on the computer on, on science? Yes. So, so I think traditionally computational methods have been much more important in the physical sciences, in physics, in engineering, and in chemistry. But the past 10 to 15 years, computers have become much more important in biological sciences. This is for two reasons. One is biological sciences have led to an explosion in the amount of data. The data coming from gene sequencing projects means we need computers just to store that information, to retrieve that information, to analyze that information. But in my own field, computation has also become important in taking our static fixed pictures of proteins and understanding how they move. It's like the difference between seeing a car stationary at the side of the road and looking in the bonnet and seeing how the engine works. And only really if you understand how the engine works can you change things. So computation is now extremely important in biology and most universities, research centres and also at the national and European level there are very large facilities available. So some of our computing is done in my own department, some in regional and national centres, but some on major European facilities as well. And this whole range of from small computing facilities to the largest possible facilities is essential for modern biological research. Um, we have here from a small company, nanotech company, uh, that develop a new DNA sequencer. Can you give uh, an idea of how this works and also the relation between that new startup company with the university? Yeah. So, so, so in, in, in Oxford, my colleague in the chemistry department, Hagen Bailey, has a, a small new company, Oxford Nanopore Technologies, and they're interested in very fast and very cheap sequencing of DNA. 
And the idea of that is so instead of sequencing just the DNA of humans, you could sequence your personal DNA and look at how that influences, as an individual, your response to medicine. So the way in which they have done this is to take a protein, which has a hole down the middle, so it's a poor protein, and the DNA molecule goes through the hole in the protein. And as it goes through, they read a signal that gives you the sequence of the DNA. So that was the fundamental science. But what has happened in this company is to take that basic science and then to translate it into something that works not in the laboratory but in the clinic and not with a complicated piece of apparatus but with a small, small device almost such that you could plug it into your computer. So that company it seems to be quite successful and what has been important has been the close relationship of the university to the development of these small companies. So the Within Oxford, there is an office in the university that if, as a, a researcher or an academic, you have a new idea that you think may be of commercial importance, we'll guide you through the legal and commercial framework to set up a company, and also we'll set, help to set up contacts with people who may finance the development of that company. Um, in the early stages, there is also some space within the university for these startup companies. So we have a special campus just north of the city, which is particularly for very early stage commercial research. But then afterwards, the company is on its own. The academic remains part of it, but the success or failure depends upon the commercial success or failure of the idea. But there have been several companies spun out of academic work in, in, in Oxford. Indeed, one of the first of these was from my department, the biochemistry department, was Oxford Glycosciences, founded by Raymond Dweck, a, prof a professor in the department. And that model proved very successful, and so many of my colleagues have now pursued this model. And this is a great change. When I started as an academic, this was not something you do. But now it's something that the university strongly encourages you to try to develop. Thank you. With all this knowledge about protein, interaction with protein and drugs, you believe that in the near future we will have the personal medicine uh, available? I, I think so. One has to be careful not to be too optimistic or not to claim that things will happen too quickly. But I think the combination of our understanding of genetics and of the individual proteins can make a difference. Let me give you an, uh, an example. One of the diseases that um, afflicts middle-aged men in, in, in Western Europe and in, in North America is gout, a very painful disease if you have that. And there was a study just searching through all the different genes to see which gene might be associated with some forms of this disease. And that led to the identification of a protein that people had not recognized before. That protein was recognized, the biochemistry makes sense in terms of what we know of the disease. And so you go from having a disease, which is very painful, for which there are some drugs, to having a gene which is associated with a protein with the disease, which can then allow you to focus in and then try to design your drug to inhibit that protein. Now, not everybody will be responsive to that, but it's very easy to see if a person with that illness, whether that protein is responsible. There are many other examples. One of my colleagues in physiology in Oxford, Fran Ashcroft, has identified a protein which, if mutated, can sometimes lead to diabetes in small children. And this has led fundamental molecular studies there have led to a change in the treatment of those children. So that, within 10 years, has gone all the way from the fundamental biochemistry to a change in practice in the hospital. It's only for a small number of children, but it makes a big difference to their lives. Thank you. And regarding your, your group, what is the background of the students and postdoc in your yeah. group? So I'm in a, uh, in a biochemistry department. We do computational work, but we have students from a wide range of backgrounds. Many of the students are chemists, so they're trained in fundamental chemistry and then come into my group to move to more biological systems. But we also have students from physics, 
biochemistry, mathematics, engineering, computer science. And I think one of the important things in modern science is to have training programs for graduate students such that if they have an undergraduate background in one discipline but wish to move to another discipline to facilitate that. Because I think we have a number of examples where people have come into, a, into biochemistry from a different range of sciences. They bring new ideas, new skills, and that moves the subject forward faster. And funding, where is your, the funding for your research? Yeah. So the funding is very diverse. Some comes from the government, from research councils, both in biological and physical sciences. But also the UK is very fortunate in having some major charities that will fund particularly biological research. So we also have major funding from the Wellcome Trust, which is a big research charity. But then also from the European Union as well. So I think it's very important to, for, the, for the dynamic of a laboratory to have your funding from multiple sources. To put it crudely, you spread your risk between different agencies. Some are national and government, some are private, and some are at the European level. And also, the advantage of having these different range of agencies is you can attract students and postdocs, not just from locally, but from across the world. And I think that is also very important. And maybe the last question. Uh, Oxford is one of the 10 best universities. Um, fortunately, in Spain, we'll have that kind of university. Could you give an advice to how should we change our university to improve the quality regarding professor, student, funding? I, I, th I think it would be arrogant of me to pretend I know all the solutions, but I can tell you what I think are some of the important features in Oxford. One is to have um, a close interrelationship between teaching and research. So the best researchers join your group by being good students. So you excite your students and they go on to do research either with you or in another university. I think the other important feature is to have students, postdocs, professors, not just from, the, in our case, the UK, but from across the world. For example, we have a very good neuroscience professor who is originally from the Netherlands, worked in the US, and now we've recruited back to Oxford. And so although obviously many of our students and postdocs are from the UK, we have people from throughout Europe, from North America, from Asia and elsewhere. And I think that creates a, a much more dynamic environment. I think also, um, inevitably, you need to build up a critical mass and success breeds success. So if you have a lively and thriving department where research is important, then you will bring more young people in. And it's supporting the young people just starting their research career that is so important.